Uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning. Welcome to Latin American Studies 201, Popular Culture in Latin America. And today I'm very excited to have Nick Morgan uh, from the University of Newcastle in the UK, who has written this article on uh, narco novelas uh, in Colombia, uh, which we're going to talk about today, Sex, Soap and Society, Telenovela Noir in Alvaro Uribe's Colombia. Um, Nick, thanks so much for doing this. And I thought I'd just uh, start off by asking if you could just sketch a little context about telenovelas, the role of telenovelas in Latin America and perhaps Colombia specifically, and, and maybe what marks narco novelas as distinct within that genre. Right, well, first of all, thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to do this. It's always nice to chat with you, John. Um, telenovelas, yeah, I mean, telenovelas are often seen as a kind of privileged site of research, right, on, on popular culture, because one of the things about them is that they have these vast audiences. And of course, they, they have these particular features, don't they? I mean, I talk about soap, but, you know, soap operas aren't exactly what telenovelas are. Telenovelas have that particular sort of arc. Um, they're melodramas and, you know, they go from, from, from A to B, but eventually they get to the end. They're not these kind of attempts to, you know, um, what's the word for it, to, to fake a kind of reality that's even more boring than the one that you're living in, which is sort of like the EastEnders thing or whatever. Well, I'm exaggerating for effect. There's plenty of melodrama in EastEnders, but you know what I mean. You mm -hmm. don't get the sense that these things could be going on forever. But of course, they're fantastically important in Latin America because they have these huge audiences. I mean, around about this period, one of the interesting things was that, you know, the biggest sort of rating successes were telenovelas and realities. Realities were just kicking in. When I arrived in Los Andes in 2002, they just started with their first kind of big reality, which was, uh, interestingly enough, it was based on telenovelas. It was called Protagonistas de Novela. So it was all of these would-be telenovela actors and actresses in, you know, in, in a house, in a room, being made to do all of these things. So it kind of brought the two things together. But you get the point anyway. And if you look at a lot of the kind of cultural criticism in places like Colombia, the, the obvious example would be Jesus Martin Barbero, who's you know, hugely important in this, right? I mean, in this article, I say some things which are a bit kind of critical of his stuff, but generally speaking, he's pretty amazing, right? There's some things that he's done. Um, so, he, you know, he did work on telenovelas and he kind of tried to work out what was it about telenovelas that was so kind of, what, what was it that made them so attractive? And of course, we know that, you know, if the formula was so easy, well, the, the, the script writers would be banging them out all the time. But there is something strange about them in that, you know, they seem to have the same ingredients, but not all of them kind of catch on. Some of them do. Um, and I mean, that my aim here wasn't, a, act, by the way, to say what that was, but it was to look at one that was particularly kind of, uh, well, that had a huge audience, let's put it that way. I mean, there are some figures in the article which are a bit dodgy. They, they came out of newspapers. I, I know there's not actually a reference to them. And it, you'd see things like, oh, 20.7% of children watch this. Well, when, where, how do we know this? But, you know, the bottom line is that a hell of a lot of people were watching this show. And what attracted my attention about this show in particular was that, of course, telenovelas, they're these melodramas. And I guess, you know, the traditional melodrama would be this sort of thing where it's, it's, it's going to be about a, a love story, essentially. Very often across kind of, you know, class lines or whatever. You know, it's the empleada who falls in love with her boss and he's got an evil girlfriend who stands in the way of true love. And of course, Martin Barbero's thing was that, well, what you get in these telenovelas is kind of like, you know, the conquest of love by the worthy working class person, which allows them to acquire some sort of uh, or to achieve some sort of recognition in this sort of, you know, tremendously unequal society. But the thing about the telenovelas was that they were kind of naughty in that. I mean, I remember I remember the. Uh, the trailers or the advertising for this show. And I was thinking, oh, that's a bit cheeky. Sin tetas no hay paraíso. Because, you know, if I think about telenovelas, I think about something that's rather, it's, it's rather kind of cautious. It's a bit strapped in. It's, it's not going to show much sort of sex and violence. It's all about the kind of, you know, the melodramatic interplay between the characters. And in fact, I think it's one of the things I point out in this. Actually, a lot of the stuff in Sin Tetas No Paraíso is exactly that. But nonetheless, it also has this kind of framing of sex and violence and prurience, which, of course, got a lot of people watching from the beginning. And 
put a lot of people's noses out of joint as well within the commentariat. You know, the kind of the, 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 the self-styled guardians of national morality were up in arms about this stuff. It was all oh, heaven forfend, you know. We, we, this is the sign, the coming of the barbarians, you know. Everything is, is crumbling. My God, look at what people are watching and consuming, you know. So that was kind of going on behind it. Right, so... So, so telenovelas are a popular culture, I guess they're popular in the both senses of the, ter of the term, both um, they, they're watched by lots of people, they're, you know, they're, they um, uh, have a, a large audience uh, and they depict or represent something about the popular, or they purport to represent something uh, about the popular. And you have this sort of new set of what you um, call other people too, narco novellas. So telenovelas and now the, the theme is um, connected with the drug trade, drug violence and, and, and drug narco culture in, in, in Colombia. And, and you get this sense of moral panic is, is the term you use uh, in which people are trying to uh, think about what it means that these series are, are popular. Um, and yeah, you're, you're trying to you're trying to complicate the ways in which um, mm. that discourse. Can you talk a little bit about the ways in which you're trying to complicate the the this sort of discourse of moral panic? Yeah, I mean, I tried to complicate it, and in some ways, I think I probably sort of I wasn't clear enough about what I was doing there because on the one hand, I'm talking about um, Jesus Martin Barbero's approach to the popular, which gives you this kind of sense that well, there's this popular subject out there you know, which which reads these things in this way. And it is it's actually very simple. It's ingeniously simple, his kind of interpretation of why telenovelas were regarded as fun. Um, and it's all, it's almost too plausible and too glib. But I mean, that's, that's sort of on, on, on one side. But then on the other side is all of this stuff, the people who are writing newspaper columns and all of this kind of stuff, who make assumptions, tremendous assumptions, who actually represent the popular through their discussion of this kind of issue, right? And I think that was a, that's a bigger problem than, than, than what Martin Barbero was doing, you know, because it tells us something about some of the dynamics of, of representation in this kind of phony public space, you know, which is created by the media. Um, you know, and, 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 and it kind of revealed a lot of things that were going on and a lot of the tensions actually in Colombian society at the time, because I mean, well, OK, all societies are in the middle of change. Right. You know, and we're undergoing tremendously fast change. Well, modern societies, right. We're going under tremendously fast changes now. But the stresses and strains in Colombian society around about that period were very, very evident. And what was also interesting about it was that it was a period where there was an attempt to kind of go back. It's not something that I talk about in the article, actually, but thinking about it now, you know, you look at the kind of Uribista discourse. So you've got this president who arrives and he says, look, I'm going to sort out the mess that is this country. And one of the ways that he does it is through these sort of appeals to sort of what I think of as kind of like 1950s values or whatever. You know, uh, it's, a, it's about uh, um, not having sex before marriage. It's this kind of uh, rather religious discourse, but it's also a discourse about authority and the importance of the family and responsibility and all of these sorts of things. And of course, you know, there's nothing new in that. But it was interesting that that, that appeared, you know, that was going on in the background. And at the same time, the very people who were regarded as those supporters of Uribe and actually would very often invoke these kind of values were also people who were frequently involved in narco-trafficking in some, in some measure, you know, either directly or on the fringes of it, <clears throat> um, and involved in all sorts of other things as well. So you have this kind of, you know, in Colombia, they love talking about the doble moral, and the doble moral was definitely working overtime. It was kind of turbocharged at this point. So, so, so that was sort of going on. But I guess what's lying underneath the whole thing is like the problematic nature of assuming that there's this popular subject out there, which kind of does stuff in a particular way because it's popular, you know? I, I like, uh, you, you, so you talk about the ways that, the, again, the moral panic, the discourse around um, these narco novellas and this particular narco novella, um, uh, above all, uh, but you also talk to people um, who, who who watch them, uh, you've, and you've got sort of two groups. Um, uh, one um, s students at uh, the Universidad de los Andes, and uh, 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 another group, sort of more, I guess, popular, right? Um, uh, less uh, elite, le less educated. And you point about the, you point out that one of the things about 
the telenovelas, and again, perhaps this one in, in particular, is it offers a whole different range uh, uh, of interpretations, which I thought was interesting. I, I want to focus on, on one thing, which is related to what you were just saying too, which is that in some ways, this novella could be interpreted in terms of its specific moment, as you're saying, Uribe's Colombia, mm. um, a moment of, of transition, um, in, in terms of uh, the relationship with the uh, drug violence, but also a, what you call an arriviste bourgeoisie and uh, a sort of challenging, um, a more settled elite on the one hand, but also that the novella seemed to speak or, or was interpreted as speaking in some ways. There's something about the Colombian national character, whatever that may be, right? The um, sort of wily attempts to sort of get on and um, related to the ideas of, the ideas of corruption, but also, you know, kind of uh, working class or popular ways in which to, to bargain and barter to improve their lot in society. I, I wonder if you could talk about uh, that sort of tension between the, the fact that on the one hand, the novellas are of their moment, but they also seem mm. to say something more general, more universal. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it's a complex one. I mean, the, the thing that you're mentioning there, the stuff about uh, what they refer to in Colombia as malicia indígena, you know, which always comes up in these, argue, in these discussions of national identity. Well, again, you know, as ever, as soon as we get talking about the nation, we're talking about a whole bunch of banalities. I mean, it's just what uh, Argentines call viveza criosa. Isn't it? That's all it is. That's malicia indígena, es viveza criosa. And it's used in exactly the same kind of way. And it's used in this sort of way, which I don't know. I mean, again, we have to be careful, right? In that uh, one of the things that I'm trying to say in this article is that taking seriously people's readings is something that, you know, we have to do. On the other hand, we are readers too. And we have to be able to generalize to some extent. Otherwise, we're, we, we can't really say much at all. But they, they seem to be things which kind of um, historically have emerged out of this sense of being left behind in, in, you know, in developmental terms and all this kind of stuff. So we may have been left behind, but at least we know how to do this. And there's a craftiness and a shrewdness and a survivalist kind of thing about us, you know, and it's, I guess there are ways of thinking about yourself, which do help you survive in a, in a kind of polity, which Again, I, you know, these are tremendous generalizations, right? You have to be really mm -hmm. careful about them. But at, there's an imaginary there. I prefer to say there, there is an imaginary there, though it's not the only one. And it's not by no means, you know, even, uh, how, how can I put it? It's, it's not some kind of monolithic thing. But there's an imaginary there which, uh, which kind of promotes these kind of ways of seeing yourself as survivors. And it thinks about society as a hostile place. Rather than, uh, you know, rather than uh, Anderson's, you know, horizontal comradeship or whatever. It's, the, it's kind of the opposite of that. You can think about the social as a place of, you know, a Hobbesian place of all against all. And what's quite interesting about this, I think, is that it takes that to the extreme. Yeah. So it says, OK, well, let's imagine in a way that Colombia really was the way a lot of people say that it is. So here it is. This is what you've got. Every single every single relationship that we turn to is somehow transactional. Yeah. It's everyone's being conned, ripped off, you know, with very few exceptions. And it seems to delight in uh, in doing that. Yeah. Gustavo Bolivar had a lot of fun with this. I mean, he's he's since gone on to be um, he's in Congress now. Right. Gustavo Bolivar. Um, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a big supporter of Gustavo Petro, so he's a kind of leftist congressman at the moment. Mm -hmm. But and there's a whole, there's a whole discussion about that. You know what is the yeah, the other thing was that Restrepo, who was the director, I mean he's someone I had a tremendous amount of respect for because although he constantly produced these sort of uh, telenovelas. With the money that he made for them, he made La Primera Noche, which was one of the few films which actually looked at forced displacement during the Uribe period. And it, you know, it appeared it appeared in cinemas for like three weeks and then disappeared, sin pena ni gloria. But it was quite a bold thing to do at that point, you know. But there's so there's a whole kind of issue about these people playing this game between kind of uh, cheap sensationalism and pandering to prurience and then kind of uh, the political things that they're shoving in there, like showing the kind of uh, the elites as just as corrupt as everybody else and of course I, my suspicion is that for a lot of people that was the major problem right it's not just that the the poverty are, are, are corrupt in all sorts of ways it's that we all are you know is the kind of idea that, get off this topic way now. no 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 I, I think you're absolutely on topic because uh you you, you actually quote martin barbero at some point 
I think, in which he says that the news has become spectacular and, and something you can't trust. And maybe one of the reasons, uh, one of the attractions of the telenovela is that the, it, they, it seems to show the way things actually work, um, that this cynicism can seem to be a sort of realism, which gets gets rid of all that notion of, you know, I don't know, the honor of the country or, 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 or these kind of ideological projections of, of, of national or gendered or whatever worth to say, actually, everything is trans transactional. Actually, you know, everything is um, is corrupt. And it's not just those down below, but also uh, those, those up above. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that notion that the telenovelas kind of show the elephant in the room in some ways. You know, they, they, they tell us open every, things that everyone knows, but, but yeah. it doesn't often get articulated. Yeah, and it takes us back to the Martin Barbero notion as well, right? Which is very much within the kind of I, I don't know, within a kind of very standard vision of hegemony theory and how this works in sort of through culture in that, you know, OK, yes, um, telenovelas speak to popular desire, but it has to be translated through ways which are acceptable to the elite. So the whole kind of thing becomes this hegemonizing exercise. Right. And I guess the very the very existence of the narco novela kind of challenges that way of thinking about these things anyway, because we can see that, you know, the companies who make them are delighted that they have these vast audiences, however potentially subversive they might be thought to be, you know. I mean, there's something tremendous, you know, the end of it is like it's, I had, I found the, the final, the final chapter is absolutely hysterical because it kind of tries to wind back on everything. You get Catalina reading the Bible, you know, um, and, and she can't go on and she's kind of set up her, well, basically she commits suicide because she's so racked by guilt, you know, but it, it seems like such a sort of paltry gesture in a society in which, well, all of the things that she's done, which might be described as bad, are merely what other people do. And her main, her main problem is that she's, too naive you know it's it's good in that sense there's a lot in common with spanish picaresque right you know the sicaresca and all that stuff you can see it sort of coming through here but yeah i mean yes i mean there's a delight i think in seeing a lot of stock characters that people recognize that you normally don't get to see so to see a politician pr presented as completely corrupt to see a plastic surgeon as someone who's willing to use used implants because it he can make a cheap a quick buck that way to see lawyers uh, you know um someone who's a lawyer right supposedly someone of some status and standing in society taking advantage of uh you know the fact that these women are dependent on him for a roof and therefore trying to get sexual favors etc these are things which people kind of recognize whether they recognize them through personal experience or they recognize them through other people's stories etc but th there are things which are there which are not normally represented yeah so just to just to wrap things up you, you point out you pointed out earlier on that uh, one of the differences between the telenovela and the anglo-american soap opera is that it has an end um mm. it has a sort of story arc um, and, and yes, you, uh, sort of spoiler alert, as my understanding is that the main character dies, uh, sort of arranges her own assassination at, at the end yes. of uh, this, this particular one. Um, and, and you point out in the article that that could lead to a, a quite conservative reading, that she sort of gets what she deserves for departing from, I don't know, traditional... Uh, or, or and other senses of, of sort of community which were initially represented by her mother, um, but on the other hand, we don't we shouldn't necessarily read the telenovela through that ending, and the the fact that we're still talking about it, uh, however many years later, right now, um, mm. shows just how rich I guess a richer text uh, it is um, uh, to to continue discussing and thinking about to be thinking about in the light of. Um, popular culture in Latin America. This has been a fantastic conversation. Thanks so much, Nick. It's been great. No, it's a talk. pleasure, John. Always a pleasure to have a chat with you. <clears throat> Thank you. Take care.